Hello and good evening all. Uh, I do hope that you are as excited as I am to welcome Chris Blandy of Blandy's Madeira to join our buyer Joe Lock MW this evening. Uh, some of you will have been lucky enough to snap up one of the sample kits and apologies for those of you who didn't get a chance to purchase one but I do hope that either way you've got something delicious in your glass this evening and I know from a few email exchanges with some of you uh, some of you have been planning to open some rather special bottles as well so uh, cheers to that. Uh, quick heads up for the evening Chris has prepared a great presentation for us all so um, we've got the session in webinar format hopefully way to do that is to contact tastings at thewinesociety.com and myself and my lovely colleague Gil behind the scenes will be able to assist. We are hoping to have time for questions however it is a jam-packed evening so I hope you don't mind you'll have to forgive us if we do run out of time uh, but please do use the Q&A to submit them if you have them and hopefully we might we might get to a couple at the end. Um, and now, since time is of the essence, and I'm sure a few of you have a aperitif style Madeira getting a little warm, uh, I'm going to hand over to our Portugal and Madeira buyer, Joe Lock MW, to introduce our guest, Chris, for the evening. So hello, Joe, and good evening. Oh, you're just on mute. Sorry, Joe. There we go. Wasn't good, evening. To you. good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone. And of course, it's an enormous pleasure to see Chris, um, who I saw in a similar format um, early this year when I first tasted through the wines um, with Chris and his winemaker, the man responsible for these wonderful, wonderful drops. Um, and it struck me at the time, as I think we said in our in our email, um, that it would just be a fantastic opportunity to, um, to, to go through those, to share those, those uh, things with you. Um, some of you might have been lucky enough to come to the presentation that Chris did for us in person when we were still doing that. Gosh, when was that? We did something at the Institute of Masters of Wine maybe three or four years ago. Um, so. And that was maybe only 30 or 40 people. So I'm hoping that today we're actually going to be able to, to reach many more of you, uh, and for Chris to share his enormous knowledge um, of Madeira and to show us some beautiful photos that will make us all feel better, as well as talking us through the wine. So uh, Chris, welcome. I'm going to hand straight over to you. Um, looking forward to the tasting. Great. Thanks, Joe, and, and thanks, Anna, and thanks everybody at the Wine Society for, for helping set this up. It's, it's a real pleasure to be uh, in front of you all once again. Unfortunately, it has to be virtually. Uh, we were just talking about five minutes ago about how amazing it is to be in front of maybe 500 people uh, for a short hour just talking about Madeira. Um, obviously, I'd like to be physically in front of you, but um, but this will do. Uh, and I think it's a great way of actually uh, getting a chance to, to talk about Madeira, uh, to, to show a few slides on, on, on the island itself, uh, and then, of course, to, to walk you through the wines. So I think we have, you know, six really interesting wines i think really show what we're trying to do uh, here at blandy's madeira and um you know as joe said a couple of them were, were were new launches this year so i think it's quite exciting to be able to share that um share that with you so uh, i'm just going to go ahead and share my screen i hope this works for everybody uh seems to be seems to be good um okay so yeah um i'm so uh, as Joe said, you know, part of the family uh, that's been on the island now for, for over 200 years. This year, we're actually celebrating our uh, 210th uh, anniversary of, of living on Madeira and, and making Madeira wine. It's amazing to think of all the businesses that we've been involved in throughout seven generations, that Madeira wine has always been a steadfast company, the legacy company. Uh, obviously, it's had its up and ups and downs uh, throughout the 18th and 19th century. Madeira wine was extremely popular around the world. And so when John Blandy, my ancestor, first came to the island, he obviously saw this really good uh, opportunity and established himself very quickly to be one of the major uh, wine shippers on the island. Uh, and he actually used his brothers in strategic locations, one down in Brazil, 
and the other across in, in the United States of America to actually act as his agents and, and represent the, uh, the family's wines in these two locations. So uh, very, very strong sales uh, throughout the uh, 19th century and even beginning uh, of the 20th century. Now, Madeira, like most wine producing regions in the world, suffered quite badly with the arrival of phylloxera and odium. Um, but Madeira really suffered at the beginning of the 20th century when, um, because of its size, global events had a, a, a lasting effect uh, on the production and, of course, on, on the continuity of, uh, of the Madeira wine trade. So, you know, Russian Revolution, First World War, Prohibition, uh, the market crash as well. You know, these, these events, uh, I wouldn't say put a nail in the coffin, but definitely um, made Madeira almost take a back seat uh, when it came to fortified wines, especially. And because we weren't large enough, um, we didn't have enough economies of scale to really bounce back quickly. Uh, we found during this period that a lot of producers uh, packed up and uh, it, it was a start um, for us as well of, of this association, which nowadays is called the Madeira Wine Company. Uh, but back at the beginning, of, in the 1920s, it was called the Madeira Wine Association. Uh, and so it was an association of, of small families, some British, some Italian, some Portuguese, all joining together um, to basically see themselves through uh, the really bleak years. Um, and it was at this time where my family was still very active here. We were very involved in shipping on Madeira, so we had enough uh, maybe economical weight and financial weight on the island to see us through and, and, and help actually develop uh, the Madeira wine trade through our association at the Madeira Wine Company. And over time, we were buying up uh, these smaller producers, enlarging our stocks. Um, and interestingly, you know, seven, well, quite a few years on, maybe uh, 50, 60, 70 years on, we are now back in uh, talking about Madeira wine as being, um, you know, the next big thing. It's amazing this underlying positive energy when it comes to Madeira wine right now. There's a lot of people. Uh, talking and, and getting really turned on about Madeira because it is this unknown quantity. It is uh, it has this amazing history to it, and I think the wines that we'll be tasting today are and hopefully will 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 hit your expectation at least. I am going to be quite provocative um, throughout this with a very simple question, which we'll get onto, uh, but it has all to do with Madeira wine and how to drink Madeira wine. Now that's a question that we get quite often as we're talking to people, but I really would like to almost put the question out to you and either come back to me uh, later uh, in the Q&A or, or even, you know, send emails out or you can put onto your social media. You know, how would you ideally drink Madeira wine? So as a little bit of an introduction, um, you know, just want to talk uh, about the island because obviously uh, this is going to define how Madeira wine is made and, and why Madeira wine is made because uh, the island itself is slightly... Uh, a little bit too far south when compared to the classical European wine growing regions. Um, but it's because of our geographical location uh, that wine almost became a necessity, you know, for the sailors back in the 15th and 16th century. They had to pick up fresh water and, and foodstuffs uh, here from the island. And of course, wine, you know, was, was, was a necessity at that time. And so how this relatively simple wine became known as a, you know, an aged, uh, concentrated, complex Madeira wine it has all to do with the fact that it was shipped around the world in the hold of the tanks, hold, uh, sorry, in the hold of the ships as discoveries were made um, across to Brazil, Africa, South Africa, uh, across to India, across the Caribbean, and up the eastern seaboard of the United States. So Madeira was one of the few wines of the world that could actually improve with these sea voyages and, uh, and became one of the wines that could actually not only improve, but last and become drinkable uh, when it reached its destination. So how is this possible? Well, it has a lot to do with the fact that Madeira wine, uh, sorry, Madeira is from a volcanic island. And uh, the data we have is that the island of Madeira was actually uh, created uh, slowly over um, five million years ago. Uh, and it's actually on this branch on the African plate. So uh, that what we call the Fratura Assorge Gibraltar, uh, that is going to be the main plate ridge. And Madeira does actually have a branch that comes off there. So there is still seismic activity on Madeira, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, 
but uh, it does come out of the bottom of the sea. Um, so it's uh, only 4.2% of uh, the whole volcanic eruption of Madeira is above sea level, uh, which obviously results in huge maritime influence uh, on the island. Um, but uh, importantly, from our agricultural side and more specifically from a Madeira wine side, is the volcanic soils that allow us uh, to age Madeira in a way that very, very few people age wine, which is through the heating process. Now, a lot of the wines we're going to be tasting today are heated naturally um, in the attic, uh, in the attic rooms of our wine lodges uh, in the center of Funchal. Um, another way of heating Madeira is through the estufaging process, which is a period where we control the heating. But all the wines you're going to be tasting today actually uh, replicate uh, what they've done for, for centuries. And, uh, and it's still, you know, with, even with all the scientific uh, uh, modernization of, of winemaking, uh, it is still uh, the best way in which uh, to age Madeira wines, in, in our opinion. Madeira itself is actually an archipelago. Uh, so there are three other, uh, sorry, two other islands uh, within the archipelago of Madeira. Um, on the top right, you have the island of Porto Santo, now, this is an older, older island when compared to Madeira. They say 8 million years old. Again, volcanic origin, but completely different in terms of terroir, in terms of microclimate. Um, it's very arid, arid uh, on that island. It has a beautiful, uh, long, golden, sandy beach. So it's a lovely tourist destination, um, but very, very different. But you do have some. In the past, you had a, um, a great range of beautiful wines coming through. And we also, this year, launched a vintage Madeira made out <clears throat> from the varietal Listraun that was uh, cultivated here on the, in Porto Santo. Uh, so it does have a huge amount of potential. And then the other set of islands are the Deserto Islands, just uh, south, uh, southeast of Madeira. Uh, there are a set of three individual islands, um, a protected, uh, protected reserve, um, beautiful swimming around there, beautiful snorkeling. And they do have their own sea, seal colony as well. And this is just quite interesting to show, you know, obviously uh, there's been a lot of talk about volcanoes um, coming up from the Canaries over the last few months. And, uh, you know, whilst there has been zero volcanic activity for, for, for as long as records show here in Madeira um, of any volcanic uh, eruptions, we do have seismic activity. As, and as you can see, uh, it was back in March uh, last year or so, right bang in the middle of, uh, or just as, as, as the pandemic started, uh, we had quite a big one, uh, about 5.2 uh, on the Richter scale, just south of Madeira, which uh, shook everybody up a bit and uh, shook quite a few houses. Uh, so it does happen, uh, but obviously not to the point where, where we are at risk of volcanic eruption. Now, as this huge mass of volcanic activity happened below the sea level, uh, you know, basically created uh, Madeira. And, and as you can see here on this, Madeira is this almost uh, a jelly bean uh, shape, um, long, elongated, uh, thin in the middle, uh, sorry, thin on the outsides and slightly fat in the middle. Um, but this allows us to actually create uh, the different microclimates on the island. So there's this big mountainous ridge running down from east to west, separating the south side from the north. Um, creating these microclimates as prevailing wind uh, comes in from the northeast part uh, of the island. So on the north side, there's going to be substantial amount of rainfall. And just to give you an idea, in uh, the southwest, of, uh, sorry, the northwest of uh, the island, uh, in an area called Port Minige, we're getting on an annual basis about just over 1,500 millimeters of, of rain. And if you compare that to the south side in Funchal, uh, we only get about 550 millimeters of rain on an annual basis. So probably a third of, of, of what they're getting on the north, we're getting on the south, which is understandable. That mountain ridge creates, um, creates a blanket in which the, the weather hits the north, all the rain falls down on the north coast and makes for a drier, sunnier south coast. That naturally brings some issues, um, you know, just in terms of water supply, especially now as construction has increased again, uh, population uh, have increased as well with people coming back and creating their first homes here in, in Madeira as well. So there is a, a water shortage on the south, but projects are underway to pump more of the water from the north onto the south. 
And of course, it makes uh, for this quite unique um, uh, UNESCO protected forest on the right. So much rainfall on the north actually allows us to, to uh, preserve this beautiful uh, Lowry silver forest in which endemic plants and trees exist. Um, and we also have endemic animals as well. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic and really worthwhile seeing. Madeira does continue to be very small. I mean, the only, it's only 286 square miles. So very, very small, highly populated on the south uh, coast, uh, less populated on, on the north. And the highest peak there, Peak Huivu, goes up to about uh, uh, 6,000 feet above sea level. Now, when we're describing Madeira, obviously, you know, imagery is, is massively important. And, and this is a real clear uh, image of, of A, the volcanic uh, influence. And you can see that lava flow coming down the valley. This is a fishing village on the north called Seychelles. Um, you can see a few pictures there, or a few uh, on the left-hand side, uh, black sandy beaches and black stone beaches, rather than your, typ your typical gold sandy beaches, which you'll find in Porto Santo. Um, also, uh, at midpoint going up to the mountain peaks, you have the Lowry Silver Protected Forest. Um, and interestingly enough, this is a really, really good location uh, for very high quality social uh, grown in the vineyards right by the sea. Again, uh, I'm, I've heard that the weather up there is, is, is pretty bad, so apologies for showing this. Uh, I wouldn't say this is today's picture. Uh, but it, uh, it's not normally this nice on the north. In the north, uh, the weather isn't as good on the south. But on the south coast, it was a little bit like this. Um, but that north coast there, uh, and you can really see that, you know, the big uh, wall of, of rock that's going to that's gonna, uh, impede any of that prevailing northeastern wind from getting across to the south. Uh, and this here is a, a, an image overlooking the, the, the peaks. Uh, so we're here at... Uh, about 1,800 meters above sea level, uh, Peak Duodiedo overlooking uh, the sunset. Um, and you get a sense for the ruggedness right up here. Not, not a lot grows up here um, at this type of altitude. Uh, and you do actually in the winter, and we did, we saw that in 2020, we actually have a, a quite a bit of snow uh, falling down in these regions. So not enough to go skiing, but definitely enough to actually reinforce the water supplies. Uh, as we go through uh, the pretty hot and dry summers. So as I already mentioned, you know, the volcanic uh, soil type is gonna be very important. Uh, the four main um, soil types that we'll find vineyards in are, are, are these that you have in front of you. Um, so uh, they're all clay-based soil types uh, for volcanic origin. Um, and more often than not, they're actually extremely fertile. The Kashkali or the stony soil obviously is not going to be as fertile as the tufa soils, um, but uh, the, as they're all clay based, they, you know, they do have a certain type of retention to, to water, but their fertility in, in soil type is, is, is actually what, what really brings agriculture to the next level here in Madeira. And not only agriculture, but also uh, the, 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 the flower side, the, the flora that we find here. Madeira for many years, Madeira is actually known as a floating garden of the Atlantic because of its ability just to you know throw a seed anywhere in the right location and anything will grow here. So if you do come to visit Madeira, not only will you get an understanding of the of the uh, the, the vigor of the vineyards uh, that we have here in the plants, uh, but also a taste of the beautiful acidity and the fresh fruit uh, that's grown on the island. So today um, we're just going to be talking about uh, the white varietals. Um, now this is quite simple when it comes to demystifying a little bit what Madeira is all about, because from the outset it might seem slightly complex uh, in terms of the different ages that we have, uh, the different varietals, the different styles, you know, when to consume, when to drink, what food pairing to go with. Uh, so I like to break it down very simply in the first four um, varietals that we have on the left-hand side. So the easy thing here, when you ever see a bottle of Madeira that has Circeal on it, you'll know immediately that it's gonna be your driest style of Madeira. And when we mean dry, we're talking around 45 grams of residual sugar, uh, dry for Madeira wine, uh, but it's always gonna be your driest style of Madeira. For the value, it's always going to be your medium dry. Uh, so again, around 70 grams per liter of residual sugar. Boile is going to be your medium rich, 
and Malmsey is going to be your richest style of Madeira. While around 90 grams per litre, Malmsey goes up from about 105 up to about 130 grams per litre residual sugar. So um, as a consumer, uh, that for me is, is super important to understand uh, so that you're knowing exactly what style of Madeira you're buying. The varietal on the right-hand side is, is a famous and very rare Tichentij. Uh, you won't find a lot of it on the market. Um, uh, or, or a lot of new Tukentish coming onto the market right now. We still have some old vintage Tukentish aging, um, but it's a varietal that's really lost its way. Um, and especially during the 80s and the 90s, where a huge amount of European funding came into Madeira for real estate and for hospitality. So uh, a lot of the classical Tukentish vineyards of the past were located on the south coast right by the sea, uh, which of course have now been replaced with hotels. Uh, but very, very, uh, makes some really interesting wine. And in terms, stylistically speaking, normally hits between uh, the medium dry and the medium rich. And before we get on um, to my provocation, um, the vineyards is uh, hugely important here, as you can imagine, Madeira, for, for one key reason, or for two main reasons. Firstly, uh, the average area of uh, vines are extremely, extremely small. So we're talking in meters, only about 1,200 square meters per grower on the island. And there are a total of about 500 uh, growers actually on the island. So it's extremely small microculture. Um, Everybody is fighting for their little bit of land, and it's all majorities on terrace, as you can see from the, from the imaging. The uh, the volcanic uh, has created these big mountains and steep valleys, so terracing is is uh, it's pronounced throughout throughout Madeira. Uh, so a lot of um, a lot of what they've a lot of the vineyards have actually been grown in latada or, or the pergola system, um, which allows the vines to be grown overhead, which results in high yields. Uh, also allows the grower to plant his cash crops down below the vines in the off season. But more importantly, it actually allows for um, humidity control. Because the higher up you have your fruit uh, off the ground, uh, the less likely you are to be attacked by humidity related illnesses. So uh, from, from a viticultural point of view, it's an extremely intelligent way of reducing uh, chemical treatments onto the vines. And so um, a lot of that still exists. A lot of it in predominantly the major wine growing regions of San Vicent and Cameron Lobos on the south. Um, but a lot of the new plantations now, um, because things of course have changed, um, have actually gone down the Espaldeira or the Espalier route. Uh, which do allow, if they're planted in the right location, so normally close by the sea, uh, they do allow for some very high quality production uh, as well. Now, this is the uh, provocation I had for you today. And obviously, you know, uh, take this with a pinch of salt because uh, the last thing I think anybody wants to do is spend a five course meal every day um, drinking each course with Madeira wine. Uh, it's not, I don't think that's what I'm saying, but I think. Uh, I, I have actually done that on quite a few occasions, and, and it is this most amazing way of, of seeing the versatility of Madeira. So I decided uh, this year to put it out there, and I've, I've asked a few people, you know, what they thought. And, and these were people, journalists, there were people in the trade, some years. Um, you know, I said, look, very directly, what do you think of this statement? Do you think it's something which is interesting to develop? And I had a lot of really interesting feedback. You know, the majority was extremely positive. Uh, a couple were saying, well, you know, maybe sherry or champagne are, are, are very good wines to, to pair up with as well, and Rieslings, of course, as well. Uh, but the, 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 the most interesting comment which I actually put up here uh, is this. I'm not going to tell you who actually wrote that, but uh, she's very well known um, uh, in the UK, and uh, she writes extremely well. Um, but I absolutely love uh, this, this phrase um, because anything that compares us to uh, the Cirque du Soleil, uh, which I've seen, uh, I have to say, I, I was very proud of that statement. Uh, but I think it's, 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 um, it's a real talking point. I'd like just to keep, ask you to keep that in the back of your head uh, as we're going through this because um, who knows, you might actually be having a Verbelio with uh, extremely well constructed hamburger that has cheese and has ham and has eggs in there. Um, you might be trying 
a five-year-old Reserva, which is a Boal and a Mamsi. You might be having that with chocolate uh, covered truffles. You might be having a five-year-old uh, Verdelli with ceviche. And when I say five-year-old, you might be having a 10-year-old Verdelli. You might be having a 2008 Verdelli. A 10-year-old Boal with uh, creme brulee. Sercial with sushi. People always raise their eyebrows at that, but it is a really, really interesting and fun food pairing. The Verdelio with cheese. I have to say I have yet to find uh, a wine, uh, especially from a cheese point, that is as successful as pairing as Madeira wine is. Not only with Verdelio, but also with Boal, not only with hard-aged cheeses, but also with, with uh, um, blue cheeses and the sticky cheeses. So I think there's a lot going for it there. Um, Sir tuna, tuna is very popular here in Madeira. Uh, with Sercial, uh, your classic chocolate cake uh, with uh, a three-year-old Duke of Cumberland, which is a medium dry, medium rich, sorry. Duke of Clarence with avocado. If you ever wanted to eat pistachio without actually eating pistachio, try this food pairing out. It is pretty special. And then finally, this is my personal choice. This is a 10-year-old Verdelli with roast chicken. And every time I have that, I have a big smile on my face. So let's get into the, uh, the tasting. Uh, so the first wine that we have on top of the table today um, is the Sercial. Uh, the Sercial is um, uh, the driest of, of, of the four main white varieties. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's going to be, and, and that's why I like to start off uh, with this particular wine. The Sercial is, is, is interesting. Historically, it's, it's never really been as um, accepted, I think, as some of the richer styles. So especially as Marmsey or, or even Boal, Sercial has always been a very, very niche product and um, very much loved by people normally in, in, in the restaurant business, uh, especially the sommeliers. You know, anything with high acid, um, they, they jump on top of it. And, and this is interestingly, though, with all the work we've been doing with the on trade and the restaurant business over the last few years, uh, Social is, is actually seen in terms of our sales, um, you know, the most interesting growth uh, because people are getting more and more used to actually having a very high acid, bone dry uh, Madeira wine. Um, small production as anything uh, when it comes to Madeira. We are, remember, we are talking about micro viticulture. Only 25 hectares uh, exist on the island. They're divided by three main regions. So we're talking on the south coast at Jardim de Serra, at about 700 meters uh, above sea level. Uh, and on the north coast, uh, two different regions, Seychelles, as I already showed you, uh, that lava coming down into the sea. Some really interesting old vineyards of uh, Seychelles, of Sercial. And then slightly higher up in Port Indonesia as well, you do have some. Uh, classic uh, vineyards. This is a picture just close to Seychelles. Uh, you can hardly see the vineyards because of the real dense vegetation uh, that is representative of the north coast of Madeira, but you see it there on the right hand side. Uh, these are actually uh, as well grown in the pergola system, uh, and so you'll be picking these really big, heavy bunches of grapes at harvest time. Um, and, and going into the wine itself, well, this is a, um, a social creator. Now, important thing to mention with Madeira is that a lot of the Madeiras that you'll find on the market, three-year-old, five-year-old, ten-year-old, those are all blends. Uh, these here, uh, the first four wines we're tasting are, are all uh, single varietal Madeiras. Now, these are uh, classified as a creator category. A creator can have anything from five years to 18 years aging in American oak barrels. Um, Anything older than that, so anything older than 20 years, then is classified as a vintage. So that's the highest premium the Madeiras that we have classified. So these are what I call ultimately a baby vintage. Okay, We will still have some of this 2008 Social aging in American oak barrels, uh, extending its aging period to whenever the decision is taken, uh, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years down the line, to bottle this then up as a vintage Madeira. So first off, you can see from the tonality, obviously this has a little bit of um, age to it. We're talking 13 years in barrel. You can see that you know, the, the pale notes from a, from a typical harvest wine uh, <clears throat> has, now, <clears throat> has now gone to this nice 
on a hammer, uh, honey amber. On the nose with Cercial, you'll always find it when compared to the other varietals, slightly more discreet on the nose. Um, that's because it's got less residual sugar. And all of our studies have shown that um, a lot of the aromatics are, are created uh, by the heat reacting with the residual sugars in the wine. So as the water is evaporating off at a very slow rate, uh, the, the, the wine is obviously concentrating and intensifying. And that uh, heat reacting with the natural sugars are going to create the, or the, the caramelization effect of the natural sugars uh, and then creating the Madeira bouquet. So as Cerciel has naturally less sugar uh, on the nose, especially at such a young wine, so 13 years old, on the nose, it's still going to be quite discreet, but I am getting a lot of this lovely nuttiness and kind of citrus notes uh, that Cerciel is renowned for. And almost, um, almost a hint of, of ginger on there as well. So um, very expressive, um, even though when compared to the other wines, is what we call a, a more discreet wine. Classic social on the palate, really attacks you with that acidity. Sugar there coats slightly the tongue, but then acidity comes and your, and your taste buds are working over time. This is the first glass of wine I had today. Uh, and I have to say, it's, it's really got me, really got me salivating. I mean, really, really lovely, razor sharp focused um, Madeira wine, almost a, a palate cleanser in its own right. But again, that nuttiness really comes through, the hint of honey there, at the end and that lovely, lovely ginger just, just gives you beautiful balance, really, really food friendly wine as well. And, and the, the lovely kind of saltiness I've now got at the back of my, uh, back of my palate. It's almost makes me want to start opening up, a, I don't know, an 18 month competi cheese and that lovely saltiness of that cheese going, going with this wine. Um, really, really interesting. So as I said, you know, the social, uh, social generally uh, has this uh, acidic dry note to it, um, but as it ages, the nuttiness really comes through. There's almost a salty, saltiness comes through, uh, beautiful honey undertones, a little bit of ginger there, um, and, uh, and really nice length, but it, it's almost a, um, a dry length as well. Um, it's, it's a delicious one. I can't really say much more to that. Um, and with everything that we're going to be tasting today, not only micro production, but also micro number of bottles. Uh, we only, this was a, a launch that we did this year uh, of the 2000 bottles that we launched. Uh, we only have nearly 800 left, and so 90 left. So um, the market's really been picking, on, picking up on to, to the social. Apologies for the uh, ambulance going through. So moving on now to Verdelho. Uh, Verdelho is the most widely planted of the white varietals uh, on the island. Uh, I think these figures are actually slightly out of date. I, I would tend to say they're probably around 70 hectares of Verdelho grown um, as of this year. I think there's been a lot of new plantations. So um, it, it's, it's not only hugely sought after in terms of Madeira wine production, <clears throat> But actually, it's also uh, very much sought after for table wine production. And um, the trouble is, is that there's a huge amount of pressure uh, from our Madeira wine production team to make sure that we have enough for the value uh, for Madeira wine production. And then we have a table wine production team as well, who are desperately trying to create and develop our own table wine under the brand Atlantis where we have a rosé and we've been uh, making white wine now for, for a couple of years. And so it's been very, very difficult to try and, um, to try and uh, find enough of these uh, this for, uh, for varietal uh, for both our Madeira wine and our, and our dry wine. Um, but there is still a lot of potential and, and we are also investing on our own vineyards to try and uh, increase this um, production capacity. The best uh, Verdelio, in my opinion, uh, is actually found in, in two specific locations. Uh, one in Chetuzeda, 
um, on the southwest of the island. So slightly high up in terms of altitude, about 500 meters above sea level. But it's in this uh, fantastic location where during the day it's extremely hot, as you can imagine. Uh, but at night, as it's uh, tucked in below a plateau called the Pal de Serra, uh, a lot of the uh, northern winds uh, hit the plateau and then come shooting down the ravines uh, to the Hampasada vineyards, uh, which actually make for the evenings, even during the summer, evenings and nights uh, in this region um, to actually be quite cold, but cold in Madeira terms. Um, so, but and so the concentration of fruit uh, delivered to, in these vineyards are, are, are really, really high, and some of our quality, most highest quality vintage uh, for their value, and of course table wine for their are, are found in this location. On the north side, um, slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, microclimate, of course, um, but the closer it's planted by the sea, uh, the less it'll be affected by the high level of rainfall. Because uh, the rainfall normally starts to, to hit uh, further higher up the mountain. So, especially in your regions of Seychelles, San Vicente, and Punta Delgada, you'll get some really, really um, high quality uh, fruit coming out of that, those vineyards as well. I think if there's one vineyard in Madeira which uh, I have to identify as, as the most beautiful vineyard, it's, it's this one here. This unfortunately is not ours. We only have two vineyards on, on Madeira. We, we only have about six hectares under our management. Uh, but this is the most stunning um, vineyard. This is in a region called Santa. Uh, it's about 300 meters above sea level and it is literally on uh, the sea cliff. So if you did want to take a very long dive, you could just you know have a glass of wine in the vineyard and, and then dive off. Um, but it is it's beautiful. He has about six hectares here uh, of this immaculately kept, kept uh, vineyard. Uh, and um, you look at it and you think, well, why isn't this in the pergola system? Well, because of its location, um, right close by the sea, um, there's not a lot of forestry around, with the exception on the right hand side, which is included in this picture. He does have some forest on the right hand side. But there's a lot of aeration that comes through on a daily basis. And so he does manage to keep humidity under control, uh, but it is absolutely stunning. The wine itself, um, so this is a wine that we launched um, back in 2019, so 11-year wine. Uh, so with our creators, we, we try and keep them between 10 and 16 years in barrel. Uh, we try and keep them basically under the same, uh, under the same uh, age reference. But here you're already getting a sense of, you know, slightly more complex notes, a little bit of honey coming, stronger honey coming through actually. Lovely citrus underlying, almost uh, marmalade, orange peel as well. Spiciness is starting to come through, which is very typical for, for aged Madeiras. And some lovely dried fruits there uh, as well in the background. Very different to, very different to the 2008 Social. Uh, this, instead of getting that steely acidity right at the beginning, you are getting a, the first coating of that lovely maple syrupish, honey type, dried fruit apricot uh, notes coming through. Um, but then, of course, again, as you'll find with all of our wines, acidity, high levels of acidity are giving that great balance. So we are talking about nearly 70 grams per litre residual sugar uh, in this particular wine, but that acidity is uh, again giving it uh, that balance. A uh, little bit of VA here as well, but that's very normal for, for Madeira wine. It, it's as a direct result of, of the aging process. Um, obviously we have limits of volatile acidity, but VA actually does also push the aromatics up. Um, so I think it's really nicely balanced here. Yeah? Yeah, and I, I just you know dream back to either a cheese platter or um, or this chicken uh, for this particular wine. Quite one of the things which is going to be quite important to remember when when consuming Madeiras, and I, and I think um, you know this was a change that we did a few years ago. Uh, on the back label, we will have serving uh, recommendation uh, temperatures, and that's very important. So I I personally like to have my dry style slightly chilled, uh, so not higher than fourteen degrees C. Uh, the richer style is not higher than 15, 16 degrees C. 
Uh, I think it's almost the, kind of the, the perfect drinking temperature for these particular wines. Now, I, I spoke a little bit uh, about um, the aging of Madeira and, and uh, you know, the, the Blandy's Wine Lodge is, is such an important um, building that we have within the company. And it, and it helps us really define what is you know, Blandy's style. Um, these are all aged in the container method and 100% and of them are aged in American oak barrels. <clears throat> the secret with us, well, apart from having a world-renowned winemaker in Francisco Albuquerque, who's now been with us for over 25 years, it's, it's the location which we're aging these Blandy's Madeiras. So right here in Funchal, so about a five minute walk from, from the office where I'm now, um, we have about 650, nearly 700,000 liters of our highest premium Madeira aging in this one building. Uh, we have 12 different aging floors. Uh, so we have um, almost 12 different microclimates. Uh, and it's fascinating to see, uh, to, to so, so much to the point where we've actually um, implemented a, a scientific research project to understand what the current humidity and temperature levels in these 12 different age rooms are currently and what they will be in the future, especially taking into account climate change. Now, heat and humidity should essentially be our friend. So the higher the higher the temperature, the more the wine will, uh, the water will evaporate off, the more the con concentrated the wine will become. But I think everything is done has to be done very carefully in order not to over evaporate wine uh, and to keep the balance, uh, especially with volatile acidity. So we're undergoing this project now and the results we've seen so far are fascinating because below each sensor, we have four barrels of exactly the same wine in each one of these 12 rooms, in Funchal and then in the aging rooms that we have in our winery at Kenny Sal. Um, and we're doing blind tastings with all the team within the winery to understand how specific temperature and humidity differences uh, have a role to play on each on the, on the development of the style of, of Madeira and which one that people actually like best. Uh, the results are fascinating. I won't bore you right now with that, but if you do come out to Madeira, we'd love to sit down and, and walk you through it. Uh, because it is actually going to set the style and set the winemaking style uh, for hopefully the next generations to come. Now on to my personal favourite varietal, which is the Boal. Um, it, to me, is uh, the perfect balance in terms of residual sugar. Uh, but it's almost like choosing your, your, your best child, isn't it? It's, uh, it's so hard to... So tired, so tired. To actually define that, but I, but I always say there is a Madeira for every occasion during the day, uh, but I just tend to lean more naturally towards a Boal. Um, amazingly, uh, very small again, only 14 hectares uh, of this, uh, grown pretty much 100% on the south coast of Madeira. Uh, we have a vineyard here in Funchal, but the largest area of Boal uh, is actually in the region of Calieta. <clears throat> so it actually extends from where that uh, black uh, pin is uh, all the way to, uh, to the west as well. Um, but still not a lot of uh, vineyard plantation um, on, on the island. So, you know, and, so we've taken it upon ourselves, so the family took it upon themselves to, 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 to invest more uh, in Buell. And, and this is my cousin Andrew's property at in Funchal, in the center of Funchal. This is Quinta Central Lucia, where he started this project uh, early 2000. And it was visionary at the time because he, he inherited this beautiful area and so uh, that had banana plantations and he was very bold to take the decision to, to actually rip out the bananas and, and, and plant these vines. And he focused very much, he started the original project as an experimental vineyard. So he had uh, uh, re representations of all the main varietals on Madeira, um, but he's now really focused on onto what the key uh, varietal is and the works best in this region, which of course is Guel. And um, as you can see from the picture on the right-hand side, um, its location is extremely close to the sea. So we're talking about an altitude of about 150 meters above sea level. But what he's done with this property as well is that he's really turned it into a dynamic wine tourism. 
uh, property. So if you if you do come to Madeira and you would like to 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 stay in one of the the family's quintas, uh, he has two. He has this the house that you can see there is Quinta San Luzia, and then next door is Quinta de Malvish, and, and both are available to stay. And, and both still, I think, represent um, a little bit of 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 how the buildings were when our ancestor John Blandy. Uh, bought them uh, back in 1824. So um, this has been with the family uh, for generations, and it's amazing to see that the vineyard and the quality of the fruit has come out of it, and the wine events uh, that we can do out of uh, the Quinta San Luzia. The wine itself, I got this lovely, lovely nutty uh, apricot nose, um, spices, uh, the tropical fruit nose with a all the while, for me, and the older they get, for me, the more tropical they get, the, the spicier they get as well, almost kind of curry notes coming through. It's really Moorish. You kind of you smell that and you think, well, I think I'm going to be drinking this whole bottle by the end of today. Lovely residual sugar there. Coats the mouth, acidity kicks in, great balance to it. Really, really nice food pairing wine. If you want anything to go with, go with a pate with a foie gras, uh, blue cheese. It's really nice, really filling. I have just realized I'm running slightly out of time, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, quickly uh, see through the, uh, the, other, um, uh, the other wines, but I'll try and be as specific as possible. This is our second quinta. Uh, so this is uh, an area that we started to manage um, back in 2012. Uh, it has four hectares uh, of Malvasia saint George, uh, sorry, three hectares of Malvasia saint George, about one hectare of Vrdelu. It's located on the north coast. And this is where we uh, are really um, investing in, in wine tourism uh, on this particular property. It's absolutely stunning. As you can see there on the picture on the right-hand side, if you do come and pick grapes with us, you will be entitled to to having meat on a stick, which is a speciality, all uh, done by hand, um, but it is absolutely delicious. Uh, it's already worthwhile coming out. Malmsey is uh, grown predominantly in, in the region of saint George. It's actually called the Malvasia of saint George. It's not the original Malmsey, which used to be called the Malvasia Candida, found on the south of the island, but this is the uh, Malvasia of saint George, which represents about 95% of all production. Um, 35 hectares, we started to plant, uh, a lot of the growers around have started to plant more and more as well. Um, because I think this is, especially in the UK market, very representative of, of what people think Madeira should be like. You know, they, they, it's that natural richness which is associated to Madeira. Um, and especially now coming into the winter season and, and, and up to Christmas, this is definitely a, a, a cold environment wine. And especially having a, you know, a fire going uh, at Christmas time, this is a lovely glass the lovely varietal to have and this this particular wine is you know it's the oldest of the four creators that we've had this is a 15 year old wine so and it's already had a few years now of, of bottle the nose in terms of the aromatics um slightly more of volatile acidity here so you really get a sense of the aromatics coming through uh, more pronounced on the nose because of the more residual sugar that we have um, but and you almost get a sense of what you're going to be tasting. It's, you almost have a sense of you're going to having that nice, rich, dark um, uh, honey cake that we have here in Madeira. Lovely marm marmalade, that butterscotch, brandy spice, crystallized fruit. I mean, it's it's, it's all there. You all come back to these wines over the next few days uh, and you'll probably be finding more and more uh, descriptors. They're, they're very difficult to get the first time, um, but it's a lovely coating wine, beautiful acidity to it. Um, really, really enjoyable and you know, almost perfect for getting ready for Christmas. Now we go on to our final two wines. Um, we have uh, two really fascinating wines. I think, uh, again, you know, starting off with uh, the slightly drier well when, when compared to the, the Marmosy. You know, there are two ways of doing it. You can either do the, the drier style first or you can do the youngest wine first. But in this case, I decided to go for uh, the style rather than the age. <clears throat> and 
the secret with these wines, with these blends, um, you know, especially when compared to single vintage Madeiras, um, it's all about uh, the vintages that you're going to be adding onto these wines. And the secret with Francisco, and I think this is one of the reasons why he's been so successful, and, and you know, our, our wines are a real reflection of, of, of his ability to understand not only how to make these amazing blends, but actually how to make consistency uh, throughout each bottling. When it comes to these older wines, we won't have that many uh, rebottlings of them because we'll probably do a total of two bottlings uh, for these older wines. But when you go down to the five-year-old and the 10-year-olds and the 15-year-olds, there, there are going to be quite a numerous number of bottlings. Uh, and his ability to not only main, maintain the quality, but actually, in a lot of cases, improve the quality as new bottlings come through is, is, is a real attribute to, to, to his understanding of, of how Madeira works. So this, again, with Wall, you know, even doing a comparison with the 2003 and with this one, obviously here we're going to have different vintages. You know, we, we try and keep the extremes as close to the 30-year-old range as possible. So we're not going to have some 1920 Wall in here, for example. Uh, but he is, he is going to try and keep it uh, as close to the average as possible. But here again, tropical fruit notes really comes through for me. Um, a lovely spiciness, almost uh, chicken tikka masala spice. Lovely dried fruits. The mouthfeel for this wine, the four creators before, they're, they're very direct and very specific. I find with this, it's, it's just a, a constant roller coaster on the palate. Uh, really, really nice. Getting attacked by all angles with, with different aromas, different flavors. Um, really, really nice. Very difficult to talk after that type of wine. Um, but lovely. Really does stand up as well. I mean, it's, it's definitely a wine that, you know, uh, demands respect almost. Um, but, you know, just that kind of lovely approachability to it as well. I mean, you know, this is just drinkable, very, very drinkable, um, lovely wine. And th this was actually bottled in 2016. So we did quite a large bottling run of this. Um, it's been ex extremely successful uh, so far. And so the idea is to try and keep this going if uh, we have enough stock left. Because obviously, you, know, you have to imagine Madeira as an inverted pyramid. Uh, as we're losing so much through lot creation, lot formation, sales, evaporation, you know, by the time you get to these very old Madeiras, you're talking a very, very small quantity of the original uh, harvested amount. Uh, so we're constantly very, very nervous about uh, looking after our stock and, you know, and leaving stock for the next generation coming through. So unfortunately, now we have to get on to our last wine. Uh, this is uh, a very exciting wine. This, uh, as Joe mentioned, this was one of the new wines that we launched this year. Uh, we only did 4,000 bottles of, of this wine, um, but uh, it almost was in celebration of the 20-year-old Tichentich that we launched um, during our bicentennial back in 2011, and uh, everybody just loved it. I mean, Tichentich, not only special, but 20-year-old as well was, was superb. So for this year, um, we also decided to do something special as it was 210 years uh, since the creation of the company. Uh, and this 20-year-old Marmsey has really, has really, really hit all of our expectations. Now, this is a, a blend of, of seven vintages. I think the oldest is from 1979. Um, and uh, you, you, you begin to understand the depth potential that Madeira has. There's a huge amount of depth to this. Um, I, I always find it quite difficult tasting Madeira's blind as we do every year, especially when these new wines come through, you know, to, to write tasting notes, because you'll need to come back to them time and time again to try and make sure that you've identified as much as you can. There's lovely old brandy notes to this in the background. Um, lovely molasses, uh, deep honey cake, spiciness as well, and, and marmalades. Yeah, lovely finish, um, dark toffee, um, 
Yeah, lovely. Oh, great one. Well, I'm, I'm, it's, it's quite sad to not be able to see reactions. Uh, that's the only bad thing about working uh, through the online um, presentations. But uh, as I promised, you know, I wanted to leave a very provocative question. And uh, I'll leave it to you. Please don't feel the need if you, if you don't want to share. But I'd love to hear your, your feedback on this. Because uh, I think the potential for this is, is huge. And uh, with that said, thank you so much for your time. Can I just um, quickly jump in here? I mean, I've been quiet all the way through because I've been transfixed both by the wines and, and, and the, the information that you've, you've packed in, Chris, as ever. There's been fantastic in, um, sharing of, of, of information about food matching as, as we've gone along. And I think, I mean, I've been lucky enough to, to, to do that with you once, but I, I think it would be fabulous sometime, Anna, if we, we ought to plan in, in, the, in, in the happy future to come, when we can do so, um, we ought to actually plan um, a dinner so that we can, we can put some of that, that theory to the test, because I think often it's, you have that experience, but for us, it's difficult perhaps to imagine some of those things working successfully and clearly you've only got a limited selection in front of you at any one time so I think that would be wonderful and I think what you were you were saying about the, the growing interest in Madeira and often it does it is helped actually by by the restaurants the top restaurants we've seen exactly the same thing happening with fine sherry and some of the mature sherries serving them with food which was you know something that took perhaps took a while to get used to and I think we're in exactly the same territory here. So it would be fabulous to do that at some stage if we can. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, you know, count on us for anything that you need. And, uh, you know, otherwise come, come out here to Madeira and we'll do it firsthand here on the island. <laughs> Well, yes, exactly. Um, I have to be honest, Gil and I behind the scenes were messaging each other, working out how we would possibly convince our boss, Tim, about how to uh, <laughs> get us out on a trip. So <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of other members who, who are doing the same and lots who've already visited who are talking in the chat. I've seen a few people, like you say, Joe, saying in the chat how they have actually had revelation is a word that is exactly the word being used. So Certainly, members who didn't get a chance to enjoy some of those pairings, um, you will hopefully have the email that includes them. If you don't, then please let us know. But as Chris said, actively encourage you to reply to my email. I can pass it on to Chris. Favourite pairings, your thoughts on them. Um, like Chris said, really, really interesting to hear who did what and who enjoyed what. So, um, yes, please do get involved and reply. Now, I'm going to throw a couple of questions at you, Chris, if that's all right. We have got a couple more minutes and I'm sure members won't mind if we overrun a minute or two. Um, but we have had a couple of members ask um, the same question, which is about American oak and why that's favoured. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your insights on that, Chris, that would be fabulous. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, not only American oak, but also very old American oak. So uh, speaking to the Coopers, and we still have four Coopers working um, here at the winery. Uh, they say that the average age of wood is, is around 80 years old. So uh, American wood generally has, uh, American oak generally has, it is more porous. So it does actually allow the wine to breathe a lot more. Um, and of course, Madeira wine is, is all about, you know, the water evaporating off and the concentration um, of, of, of the wine itself. Um, and so from, from a winemaking point of view, I think that's, that's relatively simple. From a, and, and we don't want any new oak uh, flavors or aromas onto the wine. That, that's, we've done experimentations, it hasn't worked. Uh, we've really gone to, to, you know, to what historically has worked with us. From a, from a historical base, uh, you know, you would question you know, why American oak and how do they start with American oak? My assumption, uh, especially for my, for my family at least, that there must have been some sort of circular economy going on. So, you know, wines back then, they weren't obviously shipped in bottles, they were shipped in, in oak barrels. And uh, my assumption is that as Madeira wine was shipped out and, you know, the US market for Madeira wine in the 18th and 19th century was huge. I mean, they, they say in the 18th century, 75% of all wine consumed in British America was Madeira wine. 
So there was this natural market uh, for from Madeira to, to you know to really grow, and uh, as wine got shipped out, wood then of course came came back onto the island. So that's my assumption on why American oak plays such an important role uh, in the aging of Madeira today. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to address one question quickly that's more of a stock question and then finish with uh, one final question, if that's all right. Um, but in terms of stock members, because I have had several uh, people ask, most of these wines that we've talked about this evening are still in stock. We have got two that are out of stock, but the Monzi 20 year old, we are looking frantically um, and Chris um, is working with us uh, with their with their UK importer as well to find some more of that. So the Malmsey will hopefully be coming back in stock. I will email all members tomorrow. Uh, and then I believe it's the 30 year old um, that's also currently out of stock, but we won't be able to get more of that. Everything else should still be in stock on the website. And if it's not, um, that's because it's gone out of stock during this event. And that's not an exaggeration because those were the stock checks I did earlier today, uh, literally at about 6.15. So, so please bear with us. I'll update everyone first thing tomorrow, but I do suggest if you're desperate to get anything to, to fill your boots this evening by the looks of things. Uh, oh, the 20 year old Malmsey is en route. I've just been informed. So that's great. Um, and then, so thank you. Um, I have a, uh, I have one question, but just to finish off, for those who are looking to buy or who have already purchased the Colliators, um, how would they age in bottle, Chris? Um, obviously, you recommend drinking them now, but will they age? Uh, they won't, no. I mean, they'll age in bottle, they'll, they'll last in bottle. They won't improve in bottle. So, uh, you know, the, the secrets with Madeira, it, it, it's all about you know, all the aging has been done by us, by the producers. So by the time it hits the bottle, the wine it will be able, will be ready to drink almost straight away and has the uncanny and frustrating ability to last a huge amount of time in bottle. So uh, if you're feeling, um, you know, very thrifty, put a cork back in these wines and you can open it in five years time and drink it again. And they should pretty much still be the same. So um, we had a member say exactly that earlier, Chris, in five years, they said five years, we think, and it was still tasting brilliant. <laughs> I, I have some people, I've seen people who, um, when I tell them the story uh, about Madeira wine having this uncanny aging ability, or, or, or longevity ability, should I say? They said, "Yeah, we've been drinking the same vintage for the last twenty years." <laughs> what? Well, how? You know, every time I open a vintage bottle, I normally see it off in one one setting. So, but it, but it's true. And even when you even when you pull the cork, you know, as the wine is stable, it's pretty oxi it's oxidized anyway. Uh, you know, oxygen is our friend. You just need to make sure that you know the bottle is standing up and away from direct sunlight, of course, and, and no extremes uh, and peaks and temperatures. Then, yeah, the wine should last for a long time. Fabulous. Thank you. So final question, because you have just mentioned it, actually. Um, what, why would you stand upright? Tim and Nikki have asked. Why store them upright instead of laying them down? Ah, well, well, firstly, you know, bottles lie down because, um, you know, especially if they're aging, you want to have some uniformity to, to the aging. Uh, but with Madeira, all wines are pretty much filtered by the time they get into the bottle. The wine is not going to age in bottle. Uh, we have actually found, and, and we've seen this firsthand, uh, which is horrible, any collector... And there'd be quite a few here in Madeira. And when I mean quite a few, it's not more than, you know, there's a lot more than 10, for example. Uh, they have their very old family collection of Madeira wines lying down. And they ask us to come and have a look at their stock. And they haven't seen their stock for years. And we open the doors and the acidity has basically eaten through that cork. And they've lost about 90% of all their wines. So the way we say it, especially for vintage Madeiras, acidity is going to eat through the cork quicker than the cork is going to dry out. So what we have internally here, we have an internal process in which all of our bottles are standing upright, especially the very old ones. Uh, and we'll, we'll check the cork every 15 to 20 years to see if it needs to be recorked. Oh, fascinating. Thank you very much for answering that. That was not the answer I was expecting. So <laughs> there we go. Uh, and Joe's shaking her head as if she uh, she was not expecting it either. <laughs> oh, sorry, Joe, you're on mute. Um, well, I have to be honest, we could probably talk all evening, but in the interests of allowing Chris to, to carry on with his evening and members as well, you may have dinner ready or perhaps you've enjoyed your dinner alongside those six lovely wines if you were one of the lucky ones with a pack. Um, but I have to say thank you so much to Chris and to Joe for a 
fascinating evening. It really, really was fantastic. Apologies to members who didn't get the packs, but I will email you tomorrow. But like I said, um, if you're interested in any of the wines, please go on the website this evening, because as Chris has explained, uh, small, small stocks of these wines, they're incredibly special. So Joe, I'll allow you to do a proper proper sign off, but a cheers and a huge, huge thank you to, to everyone involved in making this evening happen. Yeah, I will be very quick. Chris, Fabulous as ever. It is just so informative and so inspiring, especially when you, you realise just how little of these grapes and vineyards are planted. Uh, it's a very small place. You know, it just makes the wines even more special. And uh, it was a wonderful tasting, which I knew it would be. So thank you so much for, for giving up your evening for us. It's been great to see you again. And let's really hope that the next time we'll actually be in person. It would be, that would be fab fabulous. Be great. Well, thanks, Joe, from my side. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everybody at Wine Society for setting this up. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Lovely. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>